Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I am, as always, Nicholas Tyson, your guide, your something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so today we're going to be talking about Setsuwa, and more specifically, the Uji Shui Monogatari, which is a very fun text. <laughs> I mean, I thought I'd keep it, since this is the end of the unit, I thought I'd keep it a little light for this week, especially since you all are going to be probably stressing over your assignments as the semester comes to a close. So let's get into it. Let's take a look at our, our usual screen share goodness. All right. So before we get into the Ujishui Monogatari itself, um, I should probably talk a little bit about what Setsuwa is. Now, this is now Setsuwa did not really originate in the Kamakura period. Um, but the, probably the most famous example of a collection of Setsuwa tales uh, comes from this period, which is why I decided to introduce it now. Um, there is a like not equally but similarly well known collection called the Konjaku Monogatari that was collected. I can't really say written, and I'll explain why in a second. Collected um, at the end of the Heian period, but it's not really indicative of Heian literature. So I decided to axe it because, you know, um, it's a survey course. I have to cut something. Um, so Setsuwa is sometimes translated as, as you see here, anecdotal literature. Um, and the reason for this is because, well, the first and foremost, Setsuwa are based in, in oral tradition. Many of them are folk tales. Um, so they would have been just tales that people told to each other. But also the tales themselves have this quality of like something that you do to kind of like occupy your idle time. And so for example, the, the Setsu here in Setsuwa, like this character in Japanese, it, it's used to mean a lot of things in a lot of, um, situations. Um, for those of you who are studying Japanese are probably familiar with the um, the verb setsume suru to explain something. Um, the setsu there is a little different. In this case, the so we have the wa here does not necessarily, it's not equivalent to hanash. It's not like talking. The This wa morpheme is used oftentimes in any situation where there's like um, stories that are of an oral nature. So also like, so mythology, so myths in Japanese is shinwa. So like literally God, God tales or God stories. And the setsu here has, as I know, more the connotation of like hearsay or gossip. And as I said, so this is like, these are, these are the kinds of stories that you're expected to tell to pass the time or to sort of just like, you know, shoot the shit as we would say in English, pardon my French. And so what distinguishes Setsuwa from, well, okay, what's interesting here is that that said, like, you know, being based in oral tradition, hearsay, shooting the shit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are literary tales. This is literature. So this is like oral stories as literary text. And Setsuwa are distinguished from Monogatari primarily in that they often have this like pretense of being true even when they couldn't possibly be true, even when they're telling stories about like fantastical things that couldn't possibly have happened, but it doesn't actually matter if it's true or not. It's only, you only have to maintain the pretense that they're true. Now, this is not a hard and fast distinction. Um, from If you guys remember from your reading from the Genji, that um, there are lots of ways in which the Genji pretends to be telling sort of, a true story, like a like a chronicle, like a historical chronicle, um, and so the dividing line. And it also worth noting that the the Setsuwa collection that we're going to be looking at is calls itself a monogatari. <laughs> so, like I, again, this is a distinction that scholars make. But when you actually sort of like look at the particulars, it's not a hard and fast one. The only thing that you really need to sort of focus on is sort of that that idea of sort of the pretense of it being true, and then also it have sort of an oral background. That's really what distinguishes it from monogatari. Monogatari is sort of, in Japanese, is a, is purely fictional. Like it's it's invented fiction. There's no sense. Like it may be based on something, but there's no sense that it has that sort of like folk tale um, history to back it up. Now. 
Oh, sorry. One more important element of Setsuwa is also that they don't always, but oftentimes they are didactic in nature. So they're like fables in that sense where they're the, they have a kind of moral. Sometimes the moral is literally stated right at the end of the tale. But what's complicated about that is that the moral that's stated oftentimes, as we'll see actually in a couple of the examples that we're about to look at, that moral doesn't really match actually you know i had intended to move i'm gonna move me over here no i'm gonna keep me over here <laughs> sorry it's very distracting for me recording these videos sometimes because like where my camera is which is right up here on the right hand side of the screen it's not always where it ends up in the recording so it's it can be disorienting. Anyway, I'm just going to leave it there. You guys can suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's there's often a moral to these stories, but the moral that is sort of like there from the perspective of like what the story itself seems to be saying often is not the, the moral that is like explicitly stated at the end. Um, one last thing to note generally about Setsuwa is that, so these are collected tales. So the, these are stories that for the most part, pre-exist the the construction of this text in other words they're not being invented for this text they're being put together in this text and in this way it's very similar to um like framed story narratives like uh, i don't know boccaccio's decameron or um chaucer's canterbury tales where the individual stories themselves like the frame is invented and there, there is no major difference is that there is no frame here. They're, they're literally just collected. So whereas in like in Boccaccio and in Chaucer, the, the frame story is, is fictional, is made up by the, the author. The stories themselves are often just cribbed from somewhere else. And in fact, in several cases, Chaucer literally lifts tales from Boccaccio, tales that Boccaccio himself had lifted from somewhere else. So there's this idea that sort of like, it's just a, you're rearranging existing culture and that's actually you know that's kind of important for this period because one of the things that we've been talking about a lot in terms of like literature in the Kamakura Jidai is that oftentimes they're rereading or reinterpreting um, literature or just any like something from the past there's this curatorial I guess I, I should have thought of that earlier there's this sort of curatorial mindset where they're trying to sort of preserve and recoup these things that sort of exist within like the literary and cultural tradition but look at them from like a different historical pers perspective now there isn't necessarily a different historical perspective here but there is that sort of curatorial ethos, if you will, that that idea of sort of like maintaining the culture and sort of like reinscribing it over and over and over again. So let's get into the Uji Shui Monogatari itself. So Uji, the the titular Uji from Uji Shui, um, is just the, the town of Uji, which is sort of like a resort town near, well, at that time, it would have been like a resort town near Kyoto. There's a famous the famous like last couple last dozen or so chapters of the Genji are, are usually referred to as the Uji chapters because that's where many of them take place. Um, yeah, it's just a place. It's a place name. In fact, you can go there today. Um, it's a it's nowadays it's extremely touristy, um, but it can be fun in its own way. The the shui here means something like gleanings, so like gleanings from from Uji. The reason for it, so oftentimes it's translated, and in, in the um, the selections that I have for you guys for today, it's translated as collection of tales from Uji. The reason for this is that it's probably a like shortened version or um, a sort of, how should I put this? So there was this text called the, uh, what is it called? The Uji Danagon Monogatari, I believe. So like the, the tales of the um, Uji, Prime Minister, Uji Major Minister, um, which almost immediately after it was created was lost. <laughs> and so this text exists as an attempt to sort of like recoup that one and an attempt to try and sort of like preserve what was known of that text in this form. So this is, so you have the Uji Danago Monogatari. I think that's what it's called. I didn't actually look it up before this. I'm doing this off the top of my head. 
which was itself already a collection of pre-existing stories and pre-existing tales. And then you have the Uji Shui Monogatari, which is the which is sort of like again, it's it's like Chaucer, it's like Chaucer and Boccaccio. It's an attempt to like it keeps pulling from previous versions of this sort of like storytelling collecting experience. And so that idea of like collecting tales into a volume that's really important to understanding what this thing is. So as a, um, no one really knows who, who put these together. Um, and that's actually, I mean, that's kind of fine. You know, it's to be expected from something that is like, that is derived from the oral tradition. The whole idea of authorship itself is kind of silly when you think about it. Um, precisely because you're talking about like, in many ways, the culture writ large is producing this text. It's not just a particular individual. And the idea of sort of like collecting things or like bringing things together from disparate sources as a kind of like editorial slash scholarly slash poetic act is was already very common in Japan because we you know there are numerous poetic anthologies. You know, we we read selections from the Kokinshu, which is itself an imperial anthology. It had four people who put it together, although primarily Kino Tsuriyuki. And so that idea of sort of like gathering literary text together into sort of one like anthology or collection, like this is a this is a thing in Japanese culture and it continues after even after this point in time. Um, so generally tales in the Ujishui Monogatari of two types. So we have generic tales, and then if we scroll down a little, we have Buddhist tales. So the Buddhist tales are really only marked by the fact that like they involve religion in some way, or they or there's a Buddhist in it. <laughs> That's really only the only thing that makes them Buddhist in nature. And then generic tales, for the most part, tend to be folk tales or are clearly derived from folk tales they they have a lot of elements in them that are clearly like you know folklore in nature so the first one i want to look at is this one how someone had removed had a when removed by demons now i don't like the fact that oops, sorry let's zoom this in a bit there we go right here page 331 in the the selections that i had you that i had you guys read or look at so a when in this case, this is a, I don't understand why, look, sometimes translation choices baffle me. Um, the when here is assist. Um, generally on the face, but it could also be in the neck. Um, it's, they can be quite large. So in other words, it's just an abscess. Like it's a, it's, it's a kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of an ugly abscess. And this is a very sort of archaic term for that. It's just assist. Um, so what's interesting about this story is that, you know, you have a, a lot of common folklore elements. You have like, you know, the lone woodcutter who's all by himself out in the woods who runs into, you know, these, these supernatural creatures, in this case, a bunch of oni, a bunch of demons. Um, oni is sometimes translated as ogre, but I don't prefer that translation. I, I'm going to go with the, the editors here and call them demons. And they're all, and it says, in a noisy, jostling, so this is starting right here, in a noisy, jostling throng carrying torches that blazed as brightly as the sun, they seated themselves in a circle before the hollow tree, this is the hollow tree that the, the old woodcutter has hid himself in, the hollow tree where he, the woodcutter, was sheltering. He was almost beside himself with terror. And what's interesting about sort of what the, what's in, and this is a, a fairly common thing that you see in folklore, is oftentimes these like supernatural creatures have something like a human society. And so they, you know, they sit around, they, they drink, they entertain each other. And the, the chief Oni, the chief demon, he sort of judges them and is like, yes, that's very good. No, or, you know, <laughs> so you see an example of this right here. A young demon at the end of a row got up and walked slowly out in front of the chief, holding up a tray and evidently chattering away in a low voice. Though what it all was that he was saying the old man could not make out. The chief demon looked just like any ordinary person as he sat with a cup in his left hand and his face wreathed in smiles. So, you know, this one Oni goes over to the chief Oni and he says something to him and it makes the, him smile. But what's interesting here is right, I, this statement right here, the chief demon looked just like any ordinary person as he sat with a cup in his left hand and his face wreathed in smiles. And so it's this humanity or humanness of the, the demons that sort of puts the, the woodcutter at ease and he, he jumps out and he decides to, to dance for them. 
And this dance that he does pleases them immensely. And as a result, and then there's also this bit where <laughs> he sort of tricks them so that so the, the 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 demons they say like oh you know your dance is so good you're gonna have to always come to our parties because you're like the best entertainment you're so awesome um the old woodcutter probably doesn't want to do this <laughs> so and then and then another folklore element here is sort of like you know the game where he he plays sort of the trickster figure you know he he gets away with it by by tricking them and the way he tricks them is that sort of they insist on like holding something of his as a kind of like a deposit to, to make sure that he comes back because, but he, so what he does is he makes it seem like this ugly cyst on the side of his face is the thing that he values most in the world. And he does it in this like, Oh no, don't, don't, don't take away my cyst. No, please. No, no, please. Not my cyst. And they're like, ah, ha, ha. We, because you know, these demons are dumb. Apparently they're like, ah, ha, ha, ha. We'll, we'll, we'll take the cyst and that'll make sure that he comes back. And so they pluck it off of his face and you know, now he, looks better because his cyst has been taken away and he returns to his village and he has the and he has this neighbor who also apparently has a giant cyst on his face <laughs> and he's like oh well how did you get rid of it and then so the old man explains to him that like so let me go back to the outline here for a second so he explains to him you know this is he everything that happened he literally tells him everything that happened and the um the neighbor tries to to repeat this and it sort of en ends in disaster and then the, the the moral as as it says right here at the very end never be envious of others as they say and this is another what we encounter this in another story you guys had to read for this week which is again it's just like don't be jealous of others never be envious of your neighbor so it's it's kind of, but that's, that doesn't really seem to be the point of the story. I mean, I guess that's point, the point of part of it, but what's interesting to me as a literary scholar about this story is how in many ways it points to the kind of the, the absurdity of human relations. So oftentimes what folklore in general does is that it takes these these aspects of our society, our civilization, our culture that we take for granted, that we think of as, you know, sacrosanct, or maybe we just don't question at all. And then by, you know, making say animals do it or having demons do it, then it kind of points to the, the ridiculousness of it. In other words, the, the behavior of the, these Oni and like, you know, taking the deposit from the, the woodcutter, it's not, unlike what you might expect from like human behavior and so it allow what's interesting about stories like this is that like you know in, in having the entertainment like it's funny and it's weird and it's entertaining but the entertainment also provides a kind of outlet for for us as like hearers of the story or readers of this story to kind of laugh at ourselves in other words it presents something about our culture or ourselves that we may want to like think about or laugh at or just generally that, that if presented as the real thing if presented as it is might be a little too uh, but when put in this like folklore context when made supernatural and kind of silly and or odd in this way it's easier to examine it precisely because it's presented to us in the form of entertainment and so the one last thing that I want to point out, because this will this will relate to the um, the sparrow story, is that it's important to note that the the neighbor can't repeat what the the old what the, what the woodcutter did, what the old old man woodcutter did, precisely because he's a different person. He is a different kind of person. And so what happens with like, you know, the first character we've seen him going, like he can't repeat the experience precisely because he is differently disposed. And so one of the interesting things about like stories of this kind is that they revel in the diversity of human beings. In other words, there isn't a transcendent human being. People are different from each other. They have different life circumstances. They do different things. And the stories point that out by like literally taking all of the same events and repeating them, but you don't get a similar result precisely because the individuals themselves are of a fundamentally different nature. Now, what's interesting about the, now there's a lot of interesting things about the Sparrow stories. So this starts on 335. 
It's one of the last ones you got. It's actually the longest of the ones you guys had to read for, for this week. So uh, I don't want to like get too much into the details. So like, you know, the basic plot, the basic structure of this is you have an old woman, a granny. She says so she's what, 60? Yeah, a woman of about 60 was sitting cleansing herself of lice when she saw a boy pick up a stone and throw it at one of the sparrows that were hopping around in the garden. So long story short, the woman nurses the sparrow back to health. She takes care of, she shows compassion for it. She says, oh, poor thing, the, cried the woman, the crow will get at. And snatching it up, she revived it with her breath and gave it something to eat. At night, she placed it for safety in a little bucket. Next morning, when she gave it some rice and also a medicinal powder made from ground copper, her children and grandchildren ridiculed her. Now, this is an important point. Because again, sort of the events will be repeated, but the results will be different. One important difference, one, someone else hit and hurt the bird, the sparrow. Two, her children ridiculed her for doing this. In other words, the, the compassion that she shows the sparrow is something that is intrinsic to her. It's not something that she was told to do. It's not something she was instructed to do. It is a sign of her good nature. That's an important point. And so then what happens is then as a result of taking care of the sparrow, the sparrow eventually is nursed back to health and leaves and comes back with a calabash seed. Um, let's bring this up real quick. So we find some images. So calabashes are, are these things right here. Um, sometimes we're called bottle gourds. I prefer the term bottle gourd because it's more descriptive. Um, and so the so the sparrow comes back with a single calabash seed, and again she is ridiculed by by her family and the people that she knows. And she's like, "Well, I'm going to take the seed and I'm going to plant it." And then she plants it, and it just like it just absolutely explodes. Like there are so many calabash fruits that she she gives them to her family. She gives them she eats them herself. She gives them away to the people that she knows. And there are so many of them that she even has some left over that she can turn into gourds. And what this is referring to is the fact that like um so bottle gourds or calabashes were often used to create like storage vessels. So they would be hung up to dry. Their outer skin would would harden into like you know like a container essentially. And then all the stuff in the inside would, would dry out. And then what they would do is they would, you know, drill holes in it and they would literally use it as a container, sometimes often as a bottle. Um, oftentimes these things would be used as drinking vessels. They would store water in them when you were traveling because you, you could use it like a canteen essentially. So calabashes are actually really useful um, things because, you know, you can eat them when they're green and you can turn them into gourds and then you could use them as storage vessels. Just an amazing plant, generally speaking. And as a result of the old woman's kindness to the sparrow, she has a ton of them. And not only does she has a ton of them, but she also comes to discover once the, the, the gourds have finally dried out that they're now full of rice. And no matter how much rice she pours out of it, there's just, it, just more and more and more and more and more. And the woman then not only sort of like benefits her personally from this, she also like gives rice to away to her friends, to her family, to other people in the village. And so again, these are expressions of her personality. She is compassionate, she is generous. And as a result of her compassion and generosity, she becomes very wealthy. Enter once again, the jealous neighbor. <laughs> and so her neighbor, Okay, so it starts here. Now, the children of the woman who lived next door said to their mother, you and that woman next door are the same sort of people. By the way, they're wrong. They're, this is incorrect, but this is what they're assuming. But just look where she's got to. Why haven't you ever managed to do any good for us? Their, chill, their criticism stung the woman into going to see her neighbor. And so she asked the, 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 the woman exactly what happened. And initially, the, the old woman is a little prickly. She's like, I don't know if I want to tell you. It's like, you know, it's, I can give you some of the stuff that I have. She's like, I, I'm willing to be generous with you. I'm willing to share what I have with you. But I don't know if I want to tell you about, you know, how I acquired all of this. And eventually the neighbor presses the old woman into telling her exactly what, um, how she acquired all this stuff. And again, so like with the previous story, all of the events are repeated, but there are these tiny little differences and the tiny differences are important. So difference number one. And so as I noted here, like, so there is a, there's 
this weird this theme of like anyway i'll come back to this sorry i'm getting ahead of myself so the the neighbor woman she notices that there aren't any you know injured spares around so she herself chucks a stone at a sparrow and injures it so that she can nurse it back to health and she even thinks to herself like well if i do this to more sparrows i'll i'll, I'll be even more prosperous because i'll have like if i heal double the sparrows i'll get double the stuff by the way that's not how compassion works so she injures another sparrow and another one and then takes these three birds back and then nurses them back to health now and then eventually lets them go but what's different in this case is that whereas previously the sparrow was extremely um grateful for what the the old woman had done in this case because the, you know the, the sparrows n know that this woman injured them and then held them captive until they got better and then let them go they're extremely resentful and so as a result they kind of curse her they bring back a calabash seed but the <laughs> but first very few fruits actually grow from the calabash plant that she grows um, then on top of that, the fruit that it produces tastes awful. And so she finally thinks to herself, oh, well, I'm going to like, you know, hang these up and make gourds like the other old woman. And then I'll have infinite rice. Oh, there's an important thing to understand about this. And I forgot, I forgot this. You may not realize this. So rice in this period in particular is essentially, is essentially equivalent to money. And that's going to be true for most of like medieval Japan and even through the, the Edo period as well. Like, possession of rice is equivalent to possessing a lot of money. So if you have a lot of rice, you are wealthy def by default. It's not just that you have a lot of stuff and you can sell it off and you can make money. No, like the rice itself is indicative of having a lot of wealth, a lot of resources. So the, the neighbor woman thinks that she's going to have this happen as well. But then once the, the bottle gourds dry and she goes and checks them and they're just full of all sorts of like, what is it? Uh, they got like bugs and like venomous. Like to hold the rice. Okay, it's a. Uh, but what emerged? Okay, it's right here. But what emerged was a stream of things like horse flies, bees, centipedes, lizards, and snakes, which attacked and stung her not only on her face but all over her body. Yet she felt no pain, and thought it was rice pouring over her. For she shouted, "Wait a moment, my sparrows! Let me get it a little at a time." Out of the seven or eight gourds came a vast horde of venomous creatures, which stung the children and their mother, the latter so badly that she died. The sparrows had resented having their legs broken and had persuaded swarms of insects and reptiles to enter the gourds, whereas the sparrow next door had been grateful because when it had broken its leg, it had been saved from a crow and nursed back to health. And then once again, the, the moral is supposedly you should never be jealous of other people. But that's not really what the story is pointing out. Maybe that's what like the editor of the collection wants you to get from it. But there's again, there's there's a there's a parallel to the previous one where you're talking about two very different kinds of people. So in the one case, it's not just because of what the woman did, but what the old woman did was an expression of the kind of person she is. She's clearly a compassionate, generous individual, even in the face of other people telling her that she's crazy or she's insane or she's stupid. Like she is showing her goodness despite the world being awful to her. Whereas in the case of the neighbor, the sort of the, the, the world, sort of the people in the world sort of compel her to behave in this way, not because she's a good person, but because she's greedy and because she wants more. So even though as the children try to say like you know that that old woman is just like you you're the same kind of people in fact what the story shows is that that's not true at all and the sort of the underlying moral of the story is that there there's a sort of pseudo buddhist theme there where it's like your your goodness should be good despite receiving any reward like you should be a good gracious gener generous compassionate person even in the face of other people telling you that you're insane and the old woman is rewarded precisely because her goodness comes from herself rather than from like other people around her compelling her to behave in particular ways 
So with that in mind, let's turn to, to the, the Buddhist stories. Now, what's interesting about the Buddhist stories is that what's going to be really important here is sort of the, an ironic turn, and I'll get to that in a second. So let's talk briefly. I want to talk mostly about the, the Yoshihide story. And let's first talk about the, the priest with the big nose. So both of these stories from the Ujishui Monogatari were later adapted by one of my favorite uh, modern Japanese authors, Akuragawa Ryunosuke, into two absolutely bonkers stories. <laughs> they're they're really they're really good, but they're also kind of kind of crazy. It's one of the things I like about Akuragawa is he's very strange, very strange author. So this story is about a a court priest by the name of Zenchin. And it says he was a very saintly man being thoroughly versed in the esoteric teachings. Again, so esoteric Buddhism, not really the prominent. So this text comes from, you know, roughly the thir early 13th century, probably. Probably. We don't actually know. And by this time, you know, Pure Land Buddhism is ascendant. Uh, you know, esoteric Buddhism is kind of on the decline. And so there is a there is a there's a nostalgic quality to this. Again, it's that curatorial ethos. It's that idea of like preserving some like aspects of the past in the present time. So it's not just that he's like a, a Buddha wizard, because as I spoke as I talked earlier, <laughs> esoteric Buddhism in Japan was often understood as like Buddhism plus magic. He's not just a Buddha wizard. It's also about sort of maintaining that cultural heritage and having practiced its rights for many years and thus he was in great demand to say all manner of prayers as a result he was very prosperous and there was never a sign of dilapidation in the temple buildings or in the priest's living quarters the offerings to the buddha and the votive lamp were never neglected so the way it sets this guy up is like you know he did very well in life he was super awesome he was he was a buddha he was the best buddha wizard anybody knew however he had a huge nose <laughs> And so most of the story is about how this guy who was extremely successful in life as a Buddha wizard had this not just big nose, but this like gross nose. It's really kind of disgusting because uh, so, yeah, here you get the the story of like how he tried to treat it and tried to like he, he would periodically be able to to reduce its size by. A boy essentially boiling it in water and then laying on his side and then having someone like step on his nose to squeeze out as it says uh he would get someone to tread on it where so it starts here he would get someone to tread on it whereupon something like smoke oozed out from the hole in each of the pimples as the treading grew heavier white maggots emerged from each of the holes and were pulled out with a pair of hair tweezers a white maggot about half an inch from each hole Ooh. But even though he repeats this process over and over and over again, he can't actually like permanently reduce the size of his nose. Um, <laughs> and then you get this disgusting description of how like he would have to like hold up his nose while eating or he'd have to get like somebody else to prop up his nose with a stick. Anyway, the, I mean, most of the point of this story, I, I don't want to like, I, I have a tendency to be like, oh, this is very serious. You should pay attention to this because the church is very serious. No, the point of the story is that it's, it's funny. It's just kind of humorous. It's kind of gross and it's kind of funny and it's like... <clears throat> Yeah, you're supposed to giggle like the all of the weirdness here is supposed to be amusing it's supposed to be entertaining because again this is diversionary literature these are the kinds of stories that you know you would you would tell your friends that you're supposed to it's, it's about having fun sure there are like literary elements that we can tease out of them but in many ways the primary purpose of these stories is to have fun they're funny they're engaging they're entertaining and so that's what all of this grossness is about. I don't particularly like that aspect of the story, but some people might find it interesting. And then what's especially cool about this is that, so I, so I mentioned this idea of the ironic turn. The, the whole point is that this guy who is like super prosperous and doing really well in life, despite all that, there is this aspect of him that, and in fact, it's what most of the story is about, is this weird, like gross nose. There's this aspect of him that is unseemly. And so uh, you could say, I mean, speaking about it from the literary standpoint, you could talk about it in terms of like, you know, the way in which like we saw in the Heike Monogatari where, you know, people of high station fallen down. But 
there, that sort of fall from grace is tragic. Here, the fall from grace is silly, like with the, the bit at the acolyte at the end who can't hold up his nose properly, and then he gets steaming mad. It says right here, Zinchin was furious, and as he wiped his head and face with paper, he ordered the boy out, bellowing, you confounded idiot, a stupid lot. That's what you are, lout, sorry. That's what you are. Just go and hold up some bigwig's nose instead of mine. Then I bet you wouldn't do this, you stupid great fool. Get out, get out. Certainly I'll go and hold up his, hold his nose up, called the lad <coughs> as a parting shot. If there's anybody else with a nose like yours, you don't know what you're talking about, sir. The acolytes all went where they could not be seen and had a good laugh. And that's really kind of the point, the point of the story. Now, there is the ironic turn. Okay, that's one thing I want you guys to keep in mind, especially when we talk about the last story I'm going to talk about for today. There is the ironic turn, you know, the per person of high station who's really prosperous is demonstrated to be kind of weird and gross. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, the story is just about like, again, we are like the acolytes. We're all supposed to like titter in the dark and say, it's funny. <laughs> the, the, old, the old man's gross. <laughs> like that's kind of the point of the story. And it's worth noting that this one doesn't have a stated moral and because that's it. Like it doesn't have to be more than that. It can just be diversionary. That too is a literary purpose. So, but the one I want to end on, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, there's this point I made. Sometimes, yeah. So again, just to just to recap, there's sometimes there's not really a deeper meaning. The story is just amusing. However, humor actually serves an important function in Buddhism itself because it's you see this a lot of time, particularly in like <coughs> in Zen Buddhism, which is sort of again not the the Buddhism of the time, but you do see this a lot in Zen Buddhism where. Um, humor and humorous behavior is meant to remind you of your fundamental humanity. In other words, instead of thinking of yourself in your, your religious practice as some like aloof, like self-satisfied weirdo, as I have it here, you're supposed to remember that you are fundamentally a human being, like other human beings. You laugh, you cry, you have all the same emotions, all the same reactions as any other human being would have. And the humorousness of the story and the weirdness of it is meant to remind you of that fact, never to sort of like get too big for yourself. Now this, the last story to I want to talk about today, an extremely strange one with a really long title, how Yoshihide, a painter of Buddhist pictures, took pleasure in seeing his house on fire. Now, this story was also adapted by Akuragawa into a very, very famous story of his called The Hell Screen. Now, in Akuragawa's take on this story, I mean, the story is weird for a whole bunch of reasons. We'll get into it in a second. Um, Akuragawa's interpretation stressed the sort of like the perverse lengths to which an artist will go to like perfect his art. And so in Akuragawa's story, it, it's almost like the fire that we see in the the Uji Shui story is is in in Akuragawa's modern tale turned into a kind of like artistic madness. I don't really think that's the point of the Uji Uji story. I mean, it's kind of it's a little bit of that is there, but it's something that Akuragawa is drawing out of the story. So I so let's take so. I'm going to give you my perspective on it, and you guys are free to agree or disagree with me as you see fit. So now it is true that Yoshihide is set up as kind of a psycho, <laughs> to, be, to be perfectly honest. So, I mean, this, the story doesn't waste any time setting the scene. It's like, um, so this guy... <laughs> a long time ago, there was a painter of Buddhist pictures named Yoshihide. His neighbor's house caught fire, and when the flames threatened to engulf Yoshihide's house, too, he saved himself by running out into the street. And by the way, he doesn't help any of his family escape, and, make, and the story makes that very clear. Also inside were his wife and children, all caught the, there without even having time to dress. But Yoshihide did not give them a thought. He simply stood on the other side of the street, congratulating himself on his own escape. So again, he's set up as kind of a like, what is wrong with this guy? And even his neighbors are shocked at his behavior. So down here, the people who had come to express their condolences asked him how he could just stand there like that. What a shocking way to behave. Has some demon got into you, they asked. Yoshihide, however, only stood laughing scornfully and replied, of course not. For years now, I've not been able to paint a good halo of fire in my pictures of the god Fudol. 
So this is um Fudo Myo, who is a <coughs> one of the is a one of the guardian deities in esoteric Buddhism. Um so the, the so the reason why Yoshihide is captivated by so the, the ring of fire that surrounds his house is because for the first time he's <coughs> he, he he now has sort of like an image bank, as it were, of like how to paint how to like create the ring of fire that is supposed to surround you know fudo in the traditional images of this this guardian deity you know never mind his dying family i guess but because he he now knows how to paint it real good and what's interesting about the story is that okay so he's set up as a psycho but again like in the previous story like the sparrow story not the sparrow story sorry like the nose story there is this ironic turn. And in fact, actually, there's an ironic turn in all of these. It's it's a very common motif in the, the stories that you see in the Uji Shui Monogatari, the sort of like ironic turn at the end of the story. Like, you know, when, so in the, the secular stories, you know, when the neighbor tries the same thing, it doesn't work for them because they're a different kind of person. Um, the, the prosperous um, priest um, is actually a scumbag, <laughs> who's, a, who's a gross scumbag. And here the ironic turn is that, so Yoshihide is set up as this total crazy person. And what's interesting to know is that similar to, to some of the other stories, <clears throat> a lot of people are criticizing him for his behavior, but he sticks true to his craziness, to his, to his weirdness. And as a result, the story goes on to know. So actually, I'll just read the rest of it. Now that I've seen this, I've learned what a fire really looks like. That's a real stroke of luck. If you want to make a living at this branch of art, you can have any number of houses you like, provided you're... So it doesn't matter that he lost his house. The talent and the ability to make good images is more important because, as he said, provided you're good at painting Buddhas and gods, it's only because you have no talent for art that you set such store by material things. So what's interesting is that you see the turn starting to take place here. It's like, what's more valuable than stuff, although the fact that other people died as a result of this is a little weird. <clears throat> what's more valuable than his house, his home, his material possessions is his skill. And again, and this is sort of a weird version of it, but it's about the value of the individual in the same way that the woman who helped the sparrow, the reason why she was rewarded was because she stayed true to herself. She she is a compassionate person. She is a generous person, and so in many ways, Yoshihide, as the, as a as a true artist, he doesn't care about the stuff. He cares about developing his talent. So that's why it says at the very end, <clears throat> it was perhaps from this time on that he began to paint pictures of his curling fudo, which even nowadays people praise so highly. It was because of this weird incident and because of his willingness to stick to his guns, no matter how crazy that may be, that he became a famous artist of renown. And so, yeah, there's a strange lesson here about materialism. So that's the, that's the Buddhist part of it. But in addition to that, it's because of the disaster that Yoshihide becomes an artist of renown, as I just known, noted. And what's what's interesting about that sort of in the broader, and actually I'm sort of, you guys can read it there and you'll have access to the thing in a second. We're going to stop screen sharing. Okay. So let's, let's chat. So one of the things that I, I want to, to end, the note that I want to end on, especially, you know, given that this is sort of the last, you know, text in this unit is the what happens with Yoshihide is in many ways sort of the inverse of what we saw uh, in all of those like falls from grace in the the tales of the Heike. You know, in those cases, you saw a bunch of nobles who you sort of you know begin began life up here, and as a result of you know what happened to them, they you know declined, and that's a tragic decline. What you see in Yoshihide's case is actually sort of the opposite. Like he's reduced to like. His house, is, his house is destroyed, like everything is taken away from him. But as a result of that, he is able to sort of move up in life. And so even though the, the Tales of the Heike emphasizes like the downward motion, what's interesting about this sort of like idea that like, you know, your fortunes can change at any time, that's really common in Kamakura literature, is that you can also go up. And this is one of the few examples that we see of that. 
So as always, um, yeah, so that's uh, not as always. <laughs> uh, so that's it for, for this week. Um, this is the as always part. As always, um, take care of yourself, guys, especially given the, the world out there and the pandemic. Um, take care of each other. Stay safe. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, until next week.